Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Hello team. Welcome to Comic Commentary, tie-in issues 18 and 19. In this series, we'll be reviewing the Young Justice tie-in comics that folded directly into the story arcs of the animated series. My name's Rich, and I'm here with my amazing co-host, Emily. Hi, everybody. In Comics Commentary, we'll be discussing how the tie-in comics relate to the video game, the first two seasons of Young Justice, and the broader DC universe. But unlike our regular review episodes, we won't be having a Crashing the Mode segment, so consider this your spoiler warning. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com, on the YJFiles.tumblr.com, and at our email address, WhelmedPodcast at gmail.com. And with all that out of the way, uh, actually, hold on. I'm going to actually bring something up before we move on to handing it back to Emily. And that is, <laughs> if any of you enjoyed our theatrical absurdity... <laughs> Uh, in the last comic commentary discussing uh, Streetcar Named Desire and... and uh, Godspell. Godspell and uh, a brief interlude into uh, the classic It's Cold in Them Thar Hills. <laughs> we got a message from Greg about a week after that episode aired. <laughs> the message was, Tell Emily, Stanley Kowalski is a predator and Godspell is full of clowns. I'm a big theater geek too. <laughs> Which was awesome. <laughs> It was pretty cool. That was that was just another moment in wow, our lives are ridiculous and I love it. Uh he I, I mentioned to him, I said, uh Emily's feeling very validated right now. And his resp- <laughs> his his response was, So do I. I threw out a lot of Vens, which I'm assuming like Venn diagram crossovers, like we were talking about. Uh I threw out a lot of Vens that I don't necessarily think exist, going back to gargoyles. So um there you go, Emily. You uh, fell slap dab into uh, Greg's Venn diagram trap. Of theater nerds and Young Justice fans. I was right there in the middle. <laughs> and I had said, uh, I think you made Emily's year. And he's, his response was, happy to help. So there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. He also made it clear we could, we could uh, let everybody know. And it was under no kind of weird NDA. So there you go. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it back to... <laughs> Theater Emily for... Hello, Megan! So this week we are covering uh, issues 18 and 19, which are titled Monkey Business and Guerrilla Warfare, respectively, because we got to have all of the puns. And this is actually the second issue to be named Monkey Business. I noticed that when we were going through stuff. Is it? One of the early ones with uh, Superboy and the Joker was also called Monkey Business. Hmm, interesting. (laughs) People just really liked that pun over at DC. They had to use it more than once. Yeah. (laughs) The issue release dates were July 18th and August 29th of 2012. The timestamps in-universe were September 16th, September 22nd, 23rd, 26th, and 27th. Just scattered throughout. We couldn't have this over (laughs) one consecutive week. We just had to scatter them about like that. And the episode tie-in for this one is that it takes place just a few days after Alpha Male. Uh, the writer for this uh, arc was Greg Weisman. Penciler Christopher Jones for issue 18 and Luciano Vecchio for 19. Inker were Quest- Christopher Jones for 18 and Luciano Vecchio for 19. The colors were Zach Atkinson and the letter was Desi Cienti. Just in time for your next mission. Our establishing shot is that Robin's case notes give us a quick recap of events in Terrors, Homefront, and Alpha Male, episodes 11 through 13 of the show. And then a few days after Alpha Male, Batman sends the team to investigate another one of the brain's Cobra Venom animal testing operations, this time in an African jungle. Captain Marvel tries to tag along on this mission, but Batman stops him, reminding the 10-year-old that these superpowered teenagers don't need a babysitter. (laughs) And then they head off. I love in that scene where Batman is not saying he knows. But he knows. But he's trying to get Billy to tell him. I love that. Well, we then cut over to the team arriving in the jungle of Buunda, where the Brain, Monsieur Mala, and Ultra Humanite watch the heroes from their hideout and decide that the best plan for defeating them is to call in Grodd. Uh, back in the jungle, Aqualad and Miss Martian have a quick heart-to-heart about Tula before the whole team engages in some awkward telepathic flirting, 
But all those high school shenanigans are interrupted when the group is ambushed by a gang of enhanced gorillas. <laughs> Subtitle of these this comic commentary is All of the Gorillas. <laughs> so many. So many. Rich will and go not, into those. And none of these gorillas are random or nameless. Yep. Let's just, yeah, we'll get to that. So many gorillas. So many so, gorillas. A fight then ensues between the so many gorillas and our team of superheroes. <laughs> and the entire team is collared and captured, except for Wolf, who runs off into the jungle, and McGann, who was presumably knocked out while in camouflage mode and is nowhere to be found. The unconscious team is then brought back to the brain's hideout, where he orders the gorillas to find and retrieve Miss Martian and Wolf. And we then cut to Miss Martian waking up in a dark room with Gorilla Grodd looming over her and demanding her help. The next issue begins with McGann waking up and being confronted by Grodd and a group of other uh, sapient gorillas who explain their situation. They quickly give McGann, uh, and, you know, aka the audience, uh, the rundown on Mala, Ultra Humanite, and the brain's connected backstories. So two years ago, two scientists arrived in the jungle built a compound that they called Gorilla City, began experimenting on themselves, resulting in the supervillains that we know as Ultra Humanite and the Brain, before moving on to enhancing the local gorillas and accidentally giving them telepathy along with super strength and this sapient status. And though uh, the Brain and Mala and Ultra Humanite know that the gorillas are enhanced physically and mentally, the gorillas still communicate with them via hand signals, so they don't know about the telepathy and uh, how high their intellect has gone. Apparently, the brain has also kidnapped the gorillas' children and has threatened to kill them if the gorillas do not obey their orders. The gorillas offer to help McGann free her team if she helps free their children. McGann, of course, agrees and sets off to use her shape-shifting powers to infiltrate the compound. She then rescues the gorilla kids without much issue and returns them to their parents. Meanwhile, Robin's setting his own plan in motion, as one does. Dun-dun-dun. Robin escapes his restraints and attacks Grodd, unaware that the gorilla is on their side. He frees the rest of the team. Grodd telepathically explains the plan before they can take him down. One of the other gorillas arrives carrying a seemingly unconscious Miss Martian, and now the fully assembled team, along with the help of the sapient gorillas, attack the brain and his minions. But before they can defeat him, the brain activates the compound self-destruct mechanism, and everyone, including the villains, escapes before the entire facility blows up. The team then gets out unscathed, all of the gorilla families are reunited, and all in all, it seems like a very successful mission, and everything seems fine. Until the final panels of the issue cut to five years later with Nightwing reading his old case notes for the mission and telling us that back then we didn't know how good we had it. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Oh. <laughs> Emily, dun, dun, dun for this episode. I love it. All right. There's, let's feel some master. <laughs> go. I got so Just much. Just so many gorillas. So many gorillas. Superboy, are you all right? Fine. Feeling the aster. You first. Me first before we dive into all the gorillas. <laughs> all the gorillas. Or unless you want me to go gorilla first. It's up to you. It's up no, to no. you. No, no. You make the call this time. Do you want gorilla first or do you want to go first? Rich, I don't care. <laughs> if you if you feel the need to get all of your gorilla knowledge out in the open, go be my guest. No, you go first. Okay. So, because all of my all of my aster for this issue has nothing to do with any of the gorillas. <laughs> then do that. Uh, okay. So I the as we talked about the issue begins with kind of a recap of a couple of episodes of the show because the comic skips over some stuff. The uh -huh. comics for a while had been really episodic, one right after the other, and then this kind of cuts forward in in time a little bit and so they do that little recap of all of the issues and i love that in the middle of it as they're going through like superboy and miss martian went and did a bunch of things for a couple of episodes we all sat at home and watched tv together and it's just this hilarious panel of robin artemis and wally on the, on the couch in the cave and i love it <laughs> i just love getting to see them be normal teenagers it was really cute in the midst of all of that and speaking of them being kind of normal teenagers, I one of my favorite moments in this in this one in this arc is 
the little moment between the McGann, Wally, Artemis, Connor love rectangle that they're all stuck in at this point <laughs> right. in season one. Right. It's not a love triangle. There's four people. Well, it's funny because when I read your notes, I read it. My brain went to love triangle and I was like, wait a minute. There's one, two. Oh, no, she did write rectangle. Never <laughs> mind. That was my brain. Um, and because because this is post bereft and pre fail safe, it means that Wally and Artemis both have feelings for each other, but are firmly pretending that they don't. And neither of them know about <laughs> Super Martian yet. So I love uh, Sorry. I'm reading through this and I'm just like, I'm like, okay, okay. I remember. Okay, this is where they were in this show. Okay, I get it. <laughs> and then there's this this scene where Wally like, it's probably not at super speed, but because it's Wally, <laughs> you can picture it at super speed where he over. like, where he, where his eyes, like his whole head turns around to look at Artemis. <laughs> and because- like anybody, anybody whose head turns like that, they're going to draw like that. But I just imagine Wally doing it at like <laughs> yeah. sun at super speed, which makes it even funnier. Because they're both because they're both attempting to hit on the wrong person because Wally right. is trying so hard to flirt with Miss Martian and Artemis acting at least in part out of jealousy and Wally getting jealous in return. Artemis tries to ask out Superboy and he tries to be like, yeah, the whole whole team can go out yeah, to the whole movies team. together. Great idea because McGann and Connor are just trying to tactfully deflect and and just failing, but it's adorable. And there is that amazing panel where Wally's head just snaps in the direction of Artemis of like, what are you doing? You're not alert- allowed to flirt with other people. Only I'm allowed to do that, which is problematic in its own right, but still hilarious. But we also... I'm sorry. I just... So... <laughs> I don't even <laughs> know. Maybe Neil wants to cut this. I don't know. So when my wife and I first met... <laughs> Story time with Rich. <laughs> she asked me out. To go hiking. And I was as clueless as I always am. (laughs) And she was like, oh, you know, we should go hiking sometime. And I was like, oh, yeah. We had just met at like a party with like a bunch of friends. I was like, oh, yeah, we should get, you know, all our like our friends together and we should go on a hike. And where Superboy was trying to blow uh, Artemis off, I actually wasn't intending that. My wife was like, oh, I guess he's not interested. (laughs) <laughs> and that it was totally not the case. I was just stupid. So um, luckily I figured it out after a few days and now it's been now it's been over a decade. So we're OK. But I just think it's funny where I was like, that seemed like a perfectly reasonable response. And then I'm watch, reading this and I'm going like, OK, yeah. All right. I get it. Yeah. Probably look like I was blown around. All right. Never mind. It's mostly, that, was a, that was a ridiculous side story. Yeah, <laughs> but with the comic, it's mostly in the fact that they draw Superboy looking very uncomfortable, that Artemis is just like, want to go to the movies sometimes? And he's just kind of like rubbing the back of his neck and looking anywhere but her. And he's like, yeah, whole team bonding. Great plan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what? And they also draw Miss Martian looking kind of like concerned and feeling bad for him. Like that shot where Wally like, looks over like what are you doing miss martian's also like that's my boyfriend but i can't say anything (laughs) because they think they're a secret right right they still think they're a secret because they're precious but as a continuation of that scene we also get a few a few pages later as kind of a follow-up to that little bit of one page of romantic tension in this we also see wally's really distressed reaction to Artemis being shocked into unconsciousness before she gets collared. So it just it shows that he just genuinely does care about her. And it's kind of a nice little follow up to that of like going from Wally just being jealous to Wally genuinely cares. He's just bad at emotions sometimes. Right. Um, You were this next thing that you had written down. You've mentioned this a couple times now, I think, with the Robin. Yes. Trying Uh, to get that. Yeah, in that little telepathic teen conversation, we also get Robin trying to get Artemis to guess that it was him who ran up to her on her first day of Gotham High. Uh, Because I mentioned that to you in one of the previous ones of uh, when he's like, oh, what a coincidence. I start school in a week, too. What are the odds? And you were like, what are the odds? Yep. And we went back and forth about that. And I'm like, I am. This is the panel that like firmly convinces me that Robin spent some time in season one just trying to get Artemis to guess his secret identity so he right. didn't have to tell her. 
Because right. he literally walks over and is like, oh, you started school? Did you meet anyone interesting? Like, <laughs> boy, you're not subtle, but you have plausible deniability. Right. And I don't have this written down, but it makes me laugh so hard that Calder shuts it all down by being like, guys, we need to stop being a cliche right now. <laughs> I love that line. I love it. I love, if you're going to do it, paint it red, lampshade it, whatever, like, phrase you want to use. Though I would, me being me, I would read a whole issue that was just all of their awkward telepathic conversations in the middle of missions. Like, none of the fighting, just every panel is them just, like, talking in the middle of a stakeout. But they still haven't, they still haven't reached the uh, teenage uh, romantic comedy <laughs> levels of Ra's al Ghul and Talia discussing dating Batman. Yep. <laughs> I don't think that bar is going to ever be reached. I just never. Don't. It's it's too it's too high. But we then get the entire ensuing fight where so many gorillas attack the team. And in the middle of that, there are some really cool action shots in the middle of that of everybody doing really interesting things. But one of my favorites is that we get to see Connor just physically trying to power through being attacked by a shock collar for as long as possible. Mm. And he holds out for a while. Yeah, and that's yeah. just kind of incredible because everybody else gets a collar slapped on and goes down immediately. And they have several panels of Connor just trying to stay upright and it's so cool to see that connor is super strong he just doesn't he's just not invulnerable it's good yeah good connor trying his best and then in issue 19 in the second issue when we get mcgann waking up and having the whole telepathic conversation with the gorillas that is so cool in and of itself there's a moment where one of the gorillas just assumes that McGann was the leader of the team the whole time because she's just so powerful compared to some of them. And it's such an interesting little character moment. Well, also, also she speaks, she speaks their language yeah. sort of, right? She's yeah. telepathic. They're like, oh, well, you're, you're telepathic, which means you must be highly intelligent and, you know, yeah. you're powerful and you can do all of these things. Clearly, you're the lead. It made sense to me. Yeah, no, I found it, and I found it just so interesting because it it also shows us that that and anyone seeing her as that has never crossed McGann's mind until somebody yeah. says it to her. Because she goes, what, what do you mean? Until you thought I was the leader? I'm not the leader. Like, that's her immediate response is like, I don't lead us. And she's just so confused right off the bat that it's just so right. cool to see that, like, McGann is incredibly powerful and never thought that that's what made a good leader. And yeah, it's so interesting I, seeing that she just accepts Calder as leader because Calder's good at leading. Not Calder yeah. isn't the strongest on their team. Calder's just good at what he does. Which is interesting because it does kind of play into the like the the inherent hierarchy of power that happens like in groups of gorillas. Um, but also, I can't remember if it was Solovar or Grad who said who told her that. But if it's Grad and Grad is telling you you're clearly very powerful, I mean. This grad, we'll we'll discuss this a little later in the segment we're going to call all the gorillas. Um, the, the grad is not the same grad that we know in the comics and know in the live series and some other stuff. He's he hasn't quite gotten to that space yet, but he's still pretty. He's still you can see the seeds of him being pretty full of himself and pretty strong. Yeah, you know, powerful. So, um, yeah, I'm fascinated by that. It's just, it's so cool. I like, I like little things like that. Cause it can just be played off as like, oh, it's funny. Somebody thought that Miss Martian of all people was the leader. And then you're like, wait, that's actually a really interesting viewpoint on the dynamics between these yeah. characters. And I think it's a good, it's a good seed for McGann's growth because yes. she needs to start because her whole thing in the first season, a lot of it was, you know, following trying to be a part of the team, trying to be something she's not, and then getting these things planted along the way that help her realize that, no, you can, you can be part of a team and be, an, in, be a support for the team and powerful and independent. You don't have to follow and just do what everybody says to be part of a team. And this is also, if I remember, this is pre-failsafe. So McGann has not had the moment right. that establishes McGann as the most powerful telepathic mind most of the characters have ever encountered. Yeah, that's so, true. Like, this is just someone briefly observing her and being like, you're you're insanely powerful. Right. And right. that and McGann has never had like that kind of interaction with someone, even with her uncle. Her uncle has never been like, 
wow, you're so much more powerful than everyone else I've had to deal with. So this is kind of, this is a really interesting seed for that of planting like you are way more powerful than you think you are. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And going even further with McGann's powers in this in this issue, we also get confirmation that McGann can shapeshift into animals, apparently, which makes sense. I just had never thought of it until it was in this issue. Yeah, that's true. I mean, because the only thing we get is her. She gets the mermaid thing, right? So yeah. she's got a partial fish, you know, marine mammal thing going on. Yeah. And then obviously, you know, Garfield can turn into yeah. animals. So she must be able to. It's and like you would doesn't? assume she just doesn't. So I was it's one of those things with the comics, just I feel like at every turn the comics were like, we're just gonna do something weird with McGann's powers because we can. And none of it like contradicts anything we've been told. It's just stuff that like had never crossed my mind. Well, here's something interesting to think about. The or at least in my head, like this idea that she has seen humans a lot. Yes. And she's obsessed over humans and human interaction. So that's something that's easy for her to do. And she bases all of her shape-shifting largely on that. Where if you if you look at if you look at Jean Jones in a lot of like the animated movies and that kind of stuff, he'll turn into crazy stuff. Like dragons and four-armed aliens with snake legs. And like, you know what I mean? Like he just yeah. turns into these crazy alien bizarre form because he's like, what do I need right now? <laughs> oh, I need extra arms and a tail and teeth. Right. You know, McGann seems to be that's her thing. Like that's this humans are her thing where, of course, Gar's, you know, thing is animals like he's not as in like humans are not as like thing like and he is so into animals that that's just his natural go to. But once she meets gorillas that are intelligent and she's close to them and spends time with them, she just doesn't spend time with animals to study them or even necessarily having interest to them. And one of the only reasons she says she does it is because I guess this might make them feel more comfortable. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm going to kind of look like one, you know, she's still bright green, you know, because that makes sense. (laughs) She's still bright green and she's kind of a very, I don't know. There's like a human, human aspect to her face a little bit. Like she hasn't quite mastered this idea yet, which I love. I love it. All all very cool. It just caught me off guard because we never see her do it in the show. It's like we see mermaid tail. We see extra arms. And like it makes perfect sense, but still. <laughs> More about McGann's powers because I love them. Kind of about McGann's powers. There is a moment where uh, Connor's response to everyone assuming that Gorilla Grodd's telepathy at one point is McGann trying to reach back out to them. He just says, no, it doesn't feel right. It's not McGann. Right. And it's so, and it's just a casual little throwaway line that, and they just move past it and move on. But it's such a great little character moment for both of them because I, I like to think that Connor can tell the difference between McGann and other telepaths probably because of his experience with Ca- with Cadmus, like he's had exposure to other forms of telepathy before. Uh, but exactly. also because he just he spent so much time with her and has been in contact with her mind because like terrors and then targets both of those established that like they just have a little private mental link right. most of the time after a little while right uh and it also is great seed planting for his heartbreaking how could you think i wouldn't recognize your touch inside my mind speech in season oh. two because right. even this early he can recognize it he knows what miss martian's mind feels like and anyone is and he it's kind of hilarious that somebody Someone else uses telepathy and people are like, oh, that's Miss Martian. He's like, no, it's not. How could you guys get that confused? Right. And it's great. So I, I just had a whole like one of those things where I'm like listening to someone talk and then my brain is like making new neural connections. <laughs> so not only like so I am I was kind of in in McGann's brain. Yeah. Crawling into Connor's brain and thinking I need to change this memory of us of him being mad at me. I wonder if I can do that trying it and then having the fact that he's got this Kryptonian physiology, which clearly, I, in my opinion, he's got this crazy healing factor. Like he's got the invulnerability, but a lot of it is actually a healing factor. Like, could she maybe not do the changes she wanted to do because his physiology fought the literal changes between the connections? 
And if so, does that mean that maybe she's like, oh, well, I probably can't change people's memories or I shouldn't because there'll be an echo of it in there or whatever, when really she could change a normal human's memory whenever she wanted to. And it was just Connor's unique physiology that was stopping her. I just went on a bit of a tangent there in my head for a second. So it's an it's an interesting one. I have never seen it like that. I've never interpreted that whole thing. I know, me neither. Like that, but and like to me, it doesn't fit with the way we see it presented and the way we see Connor's response to it. Because to me, it always it always like we're gonna get into we like we talked about this in season two, but it, to me, it always seemed like he just recognized her touch inside his mind before she could even try to do anything and him recognizing it and being like what are you doing stopped Mm. her before she could actually try anything i'm like emotions and romantic relationships and rich is like okay but what if science (laughs) yeah well i'm thinking yes that is true i'm thinking of the neurophysiology of the how memories work with neural pathway connections and how you would go in and change those things you know, and how you would tweak them. It's not like editing software for a movie. I mean, it's going to be different, you know? So yeah, there you go. I don't know. Anyway, interesting. And still going off of all of this because I didn't care about the main story this time. I did. I did care about the main story, but I'm me and focus in on other things. I think it's hilarious that in this issue, what that we get confirmation later in the series that like Connor has seen and understands McGann as like a giant inhuman terrifying skeletal monster and is just like it's fine I will still hold your hand you're still my girlfriend love you but she briefly takes the form of a gorilla and is just like can you not can you not today can you just, can you just- don't go there. Can you just, like, no? Can you not? But at the same time, like, I feel the same way. Miss Martian is a gorilla. I'm just reading it. I'm like, this is weird. And then I don't even know why. I'm like, y- you're a giant white Martian <laughs> monster, and I'm fine with that. So is Connor. Gorilla's weird for some reason. <laughs> yeah. That's so interesting. I don't know if we need to do much of a deep... Let's not deep dive into that. There's some psychology <laughs> going on there. Rich made it weird, guys. Uh, <laughs> me this is your seg this is your part of the show <laughs> i'm just saying i think it's funny that connor's chill about certain things and not others oh, oh okay uh, oh, no. all right uh do you want gorillas. to talk about gorillas or do you want my last note no no throw this note out because i think it's a good one so we talked about this really briefly in uh the mission brief uh about how the last few panels of this issue have Nightwing rereading his old case notes uh, in the cave and like experiencing this whole adventure that we've just read. And then he just has this line where he says, gorillas, man, those were the days all Aster, no diss. We didn't know how good we had it. And this is probably one of the best, like tune in next month to see what happens bits that the comics ever did. Cause like this genuinely are like, Whoa, what are what storyline are we going into now? We got we suddenly we've cut to Nightwing and that's great. But I do just generally have like this emotional memory of the first time I read this back when they first came out. I was so angry at that last panel. I was so mad. Like not just sad, I was angry because this it, these two issues came out during season 2 which was when I was still just clinging to the comics as my last connection to the season one characters and dynamics that I was so invested in. And then this happened and I was like, really, really, you've taken all of season one away from me, which is just the emotional preteen reaction I have because I just want to know about the five years, guys. How much do I have to pay DC Comics? So this is interesting to me. So did you did you do all the math on this too? Because... It's so because the first season one had so many hiatuses. Yeah. They had nine plus months of hiatuses that season one finale came out. And then the week later, the season one, season two premiere happened. Like in any normal circumstances, there would have been what? At least six months, eight months of space between the two seasons. Meaning that how do you plan? Like they can't plan the release dates of when things are coming out because Cartoon Network is going to control that. They probably can't control the release of the comics, but they were clearly coming out monthly and they started it at a particular point, expecting it to come out at a particular point. Yeah. I think 
they're like I'm trying to remember because I feel like I've read some stuff about this. I feel like there was some plan initially that was like the video game that came out after season two was like intended, I believe, if I'm remembering to be between seasons, to be between seasons, to come out. That's what it should have been. Yeah, because that would have made sense because that's what the video game is. It's the it's that and the final arc of the comics are the only glimpse we get into those five years as far as we have right now. Fingers crossed for someday, maybe. So I don't know if they had intended these last few comic issue arcs to come out in what would have been a normal hiatus that made sense. But yeah, this is what because it would have been. I thought I think it would be would have been really interesting. I, I like the whole fact that the video game didn't come out in between seasons is weird to me. Yeah, and the fact that the this comic didn't end. I would have liked to have seen this comic happen in between seasons as yeah, well. I agree. And, and reward people who were reading the comics with a, wait, what? Like, yeah. kind of a thing that lead, and then having a delay, and then season two starts, right? Or getting this in between seasons thing happening. Yeah. And I think on some level, I can't be sure because this didn't happen. Uh, I feel like that would have gone over better with fans because I know I was not the only person who responded to the five-year time skip the way I did and I talked about it before and I'm okay with it now and I understand what they're doing and all of that but like at the time I was so angry with the five-year yeah. time skip because I was 13. Uh, yeah you were also that Venn diagram space of people who were actively reading the tie-in comics and actively watching the show and unfortunately those numbers aren't very high. Yeah. Like as, as much as I loved and rewatched the show over and over again, it was a while before I even realized that there were tying that, that I, I think I knew that there were comics. I did not realize that they had tied them so tightly. I figured, Oh, it's a different creative team. They're probably just writing little one shots. They might be good. They might not be good, but they couldn't be this. Yeah. You know, they're like trying to, you know, catch lightning in a bottle over in the comics because like the DC, like the, in the DC animated universe for Batman the Animated Series and Superman the Animated Series and Justice League, they had that Batman the Animated Series comic that they did was amazing. It was so good and it was so refreshing. Christopher Jones and I talk about it a little bit in his um, interview. Um, and it was great, but it wasn't, it, it was kind of loosely tied to the show, right? Yeah. Yeah, And so I kind of expected this to be like, oh, it's a little one shot here and it's a little one shot there and we'll get some little stories back and forth but man i wish i'd have known at the time that they were coming out and what they were trying to do with it because it was it's unique in the industry it's it's insane i love it i love i love talking about how these comics did what they did because it's fascinating yeah and a next 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 comics commentary we're gonna go into that invasion arc with nightwing so that'll be yeah fun. yeah it's gonna be a few episodes on that one Maybe maybe a couple, maybe. <laughs> maybe maybe at least three. Maybe. <laughs> all right, so let's go into our next segment, uh, the one uh, episode segment we're calling All the Gorillas. How many gorillas are there, Rich? Let me count. Okay, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. There are 16 canon DC Comics gorillas in this episode, in this episode, in this issue. Rich, did you just say that there's 16 of them? There sure are. Plus the brain. <laughs> okay, but like 16. 16. Oh, yeah. No, the number did not escape me. Because there's not more of them. There's more. There's more in there. In the, in the comics, gorillas and monkeys are big business. But don't bump. So I'll just I'll just sit back and let you okay. explain the gorillas. <laughs> All right. So first thing, I have to take the gorillas in order, guys. I don't know how else to do it. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is going to start off with the brain for a minute. All right. So they show the brain in the comic. He is, he looks like kind of a younger guy who is made to look old. It's weird. I can't tell the age on that, on his like art on that one. But what the in the comics, the brain got a gorilla and increased the gorilla's 
IQ to 178, very specific. Uh, that was Mala, Monsieur Mala. And then when the brain was having problems uh, with his body, they, uh, well, <laughs> how much am I going to get into this? All right, you guys have heard me talk about the Doom Patrol on the, the show quite a few times. So the original per character who was the brain, who I'm not entirely convinced he's ever been named, was a contemporary of Niles Calder. And Niles Calder is the character known as the Chief, who runs the Doom Patrol. And they were both scientists. Some accident happened. Uh, I, don't, I can't tell if Niles, uh, if the Chief kind of did this explosion on purpose or something, but somehow the, his body was damaged. And then Mala took his brain and put it in, you know, this container to keep him alive. Um, Niles Calder, of course, had perfected the ability to take a brain and put it into a robot body, which he does with uh, one of the characters from the Doom Patrol, Robot Man. But um, uh, the Mala got to him first. So that's what happened in the comics. In this issue, they talk about it, it was this thing that they had done during these experiments that they were doing in the, in the comic. In addition to that, they had gone out to do these experiments with this cobra venom and this other stuff, and they had created Gorilla City. So if you've read DC Comics for a while or you're familiar with the Justice League animated series or the live-action Flash series, there is a kind of a canon DC city called Gorilla City, and it's in a highly advanced city run by intelligent gorillas and the characters of Gorilla Grodd and, you know, 15 others I'm going to talk about all basically come from Gorilla City. So in the in the Young Justice universe, it's interesting that it's the brain who in the comics had been had technology to raise Mala's intelligence combined with the Cobra Venom, um, making them even more and more powerful and then building this quote unquote Gorilla City, which was just like a, a, a series of structures really at the time. And then, of course, at the end of the comic, they're like, we well, maybe we'll make our own Gorilla City. And so now we know how you know, the planet of the apes started in the Young Justice universe. <laughs> um, so so that's kind of the brain and Mala. And I have said in the comic, or I said in the series, that the brain and Mala have um, squared off against uh, Captain Marvel or Shazam. And though that's true, the brain has teamed up with Dr. Savannah, who's a classic Shazam villain in the past. He was really a kind of a villain of the Doom Patrol and also kind of like, you know, super, Superman gets involved and some other stuff too. But mostly he's kind of a Doom Patrol villain with the two of them. Oh, man, there's so much going on. Okay, so that's the brain and Mala. And then you get the Ultra Humanite. Ultra Humanite was a, a villainous scientist who predates Luther in Superman's kind of uh, pantheon of nemeses. And through the age has transferred his brain into numerous bodies. So, and I say he because he originally started off as being a he super scientist. You'll say, but Rich, Ultra Humanite was a woman in the comics. Why, yes, 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 she was. Uh, because the male character, who again, I, do we know his name? No, I don't even know if we know his name. He transferred his brain into the body of actress Dolores Winters. And then because as he was trying to escape Superman and all the people who were hounding him because, you know, supervillain, he figured no one would uh, suspect uh, a TV star, movie star of the 1940s and 50s. So um, Dolores Winters became a, uh, a super science supervillain at that point. And so this is who I think is in the comic. Um, Dolores Winters has gotten older. She needs a new body, etc. In the comics, Ultra Humanite transfers her body, now we call her her, her body into, it just says an albino, develop, it developed this albino gorilla originally from Gorilla City to house his super brain and her super brain and abilities. I find it as, as a side note on that, because there are so many weird gender issues going on with that whole situation. The yeah. comic very carefully avoids ever using pronouns for ultra humanite. To just yeah. leave it up in the air. And I noticed that and thought it was interesting. <laughs> yeah. We do not know. I do not know what Ultra Humanite's preferred pronouns are. <laughs> so we'll say them, they. I'm not sure. All right. So, so in the comics, there's this unnamed white gorilla that Ultra Humanite uses to put their brain into. So Greg, in his 
and the creative team, I'm guessing this was Greg, was like, well, why waste an unnamed white furred gorilla? There's got to be a white furred gorilla in the DC comics somewhere. Go why find... Waste, why waste a perfectly good gorilla? <laughs> Where's... Ring the bell for the intern. Intern! Fetch me a gorilla. <laughs> fetch, fetch me an albino gorilla in the DC universe. Oh, we happen to have one, of course, Tolafar, who they talk about in the, in the comic. Tolafar uh, was a leader of a, a white-furred group of, I, I can't even believe I'm going to say this, guerrilla fighters, uh, guerrilla knights, specialists knights, that were genetically modified originally by Gorilla Grodd from the comics. But in here, Tolafar was one of their leaders. In the comics, he actually super, or excuse me, Wonder Woman persuades them to switch sides after this, from Gorilla Grodd to their side after this battle, and becomes Wonder Woman becomes like their ally. At, at one point, this like group of Gorilla Knights is like living in Diana's apartment in like New York or something. It's really funny, or Washington. Yeah, it's just I didn't even know. Anyway, so that's Tolafar. So now we've got Tolafar. Who is a who is a powerful warrior and leader and, and combatant in the comics is now used as the body for ultra humanite. <sighs> so now we get to Grodd. We're not even halfway through, guys. So now we get to Grodd. Now, the Grodd that we see, as I mentioned, is not the Grodd that we know from a lot of other things. So Grodd has appeared in Justice League Unlimited. He's appeared in the Justice League animated series. He has uh he has a version of him um in the live action Flash series, which is actually pretty horrifying and cool. Um, but he's been a classic villain for a very long time, a classic Flash villain for a very, very long time. But in here, we see him before he's even developed these abilities. And in it's typical in the comics, although there are some telepathic and psychically powerful gorillas from Gorilla City, Grodd is the most powerful one. And it's interesting to me here that instead of having characters like Solovar and these other apes that um, just speak you know, English in the animated series and the comics, that they're all telepathic is really interesting to me. And so we get the beginning steps of Gorilla Grodd and his kind of the insights into like his manipulation and his like hiding his powers and what power level he has, him commenting on him or Solovar, I think it was him commenting on um, McGann being extremely powerful, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so Grodd is, I don't know, he's the, he is the supervillain gorilla. Then we're going to get to Solovar. Solovar is often depicted as uh, highly intelligent, of course, like all the gorillas from Gorilla City, uh, but the head of security, basically, for Gorilla City. Uh, and he has his wife, uh, he mentions his wife, Boca, as well. Um, Boca is like the love interest between Solovar and Gorilla Grodd, and that's a whole like love triangle thing going on in the comics. Um, in here, Solovar... Is able in the comic in this comic, the Young Justice comic, uh, Boca is actually Solovar's bride, and we don't get into any of that weirdness. Gorilla love triangle. It was a gorilla love triangle. It it one hundred percent was. Yeah, yeah. He was engaged to marry Boca, and then Grodd caught her eye, and like it just became a thing. It was just yeah. Anyway, all right. Uh, anyway, so Boca is the the wife. Uh, also, uh, as any of the other apes from Gorilla City. Uh, both in the comic and then these characters, genius level intellect, and also uh, like an engineer, um, excellent with technology. So that's who she is. That's all we've got. Now we start getting into some of the other characters where they were just pulling them out of back closets. I swear it was just to get 16 in this issue. Primate is mentioned pretty quickly. Another female gorilla. She's part of an or a group called the Dreambound. <laughs> what? Yep. Oh, Yeah. The only notes I put into my outline today, everyone, it just says all the gorillas. So this is all new news to Emily. So she's learning along with you guys. Uh, yeah. So there's a group called the Dreambound. And the Dreambound were this group of heroes? Villains? I'm not quite sure. That were put together based on manifesting their own dreams and getting symbolic pieces from various, from basically the trinity of the DC comics, so Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, um, so that they could fight them. But then they became heroes. It's it's bizarre. She's very nice. That's the only thing I can figure out from any of these comics. She's very nice. Likes romance. 
that's what I know about Primate, but she's there. All right, so now let's see how we're getting into. I think these are all the kids that they were mentioning. <laughs> so then there was uh, Namdi. Uh, Namdi at one point was the leader of uh, Gorilla City. Um, I think in the New Fifty Two, uh, he is the current king, and his father was Solovar. Although in the comics he's full grown, but in this comic I think he's a little kid. So we've got that character of Namdi. We have, and I can't even believe where he pulled this from. The one that was named Simeon, uh, because comics, uh, S-I-M-E-O-N. His full name is actually Sam Simeon. Uh, Sam Simeon is from, <laughs> it's from, oh my God. No, it's from a comic series called <laughs> The Angel and the Ape. He is a detective uh, for the Angel Detective Agency. He is the, in the comics, in the standard comic run, he's the grandson of Gorilla Grodd, but here he is apparently the son of Gorilla Grodd because they actually specifically make a comment about how Simeon looks like Grodd and will grow up to be just like him. And in the comics, like I mentioned, uh, Grodd is one of the few that has like full telepathic and like mind control abilities and stuff, but Simeon does also. And in some interpretations, he's, he's a Gorilla at this detective agency wearing a suit and using firearms and smoking cigarette. Uh, I don't even know. And he uses his mind control powers, mental illusion powers to convince other people that he's just a really big guy. <laughs> and then if that illusion drops, then people figure out that he's actually uh, a gorilla. <laughs> and he works alongside Angelo Day, who's like the main detective for this detective agency. Oh, we're still going. Rich, I'm dying. <laughs> we're still going. We're still going. All right, so... Olgo, Olgo, one of the other kids, Prince Olgo. I guess at some point in time, uh, Solvar becomes king in the comics because, I don't know, he's a named character. And so uh, Olgo is his nephew, which makes Namdi uh, Olgo's cousin. All right, so that's all there. That's that gorilla family tree. <laughs> and so he's the prince regent of Gorilla City in the in these comics, so... They've got him in here as well as one of the kids. All right, we're going to move on to uh, Kamau, who I have nothing. Showed up in a comic one time. Kamau is the uh, friend of Namdi. That's all I got. So I can't find anything else necessarily about this character, except it's got a uh, he or she, he, male, has a name. That's it. I want to give a shout out to the DC uh, wiki. Uh, for a lot of this information, too, because, man, there was just too much to look up. All right, so now we've got to Toto. We've got a few more to go. So Toto, when I was looking up Toto... You had the shout-out, so I was like, oh, we have reached the end. Oh, no, 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 nope, 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 nope. We've got one, two, three, four, and my favorite left, so there's five to go. All right, so let's get to Toto. So Toto is not technically is named Toto in the comics originally, but then becomes Titano because Titano was created in an age kind of post King Kong. And, you know, you got to have that trope. So Titano is actually the super ape in which he has um, things like not just heat vision, but kryptonite vision because, you know, it, Superman has to fight Superman um, and uh, grows to be an enormous size. Uh, so while he was in a space satellite, because Toto was going up to be a space ape, he was bombarded with radiation after like a meteor went by or it exploded or something. Uh, oh, I think one of them, one, there was two meteors, I think. And then one of them was like kryptonite and the other one was like plutonium or something. I don't know. So they just blew up next to him, turned him into a giant kryptonite eye wielding super ape. So we can look forward to that in season four, I think. <laughs> All right. Then we have uh, Nzame. Uh, Nzame is a, another white ape from Gorilla City. But Nzame is uh, actually was like a healer. So I think he had some kind of psychic healing powers. So it plays off that old trope of, um, you know, white uh, albino animals being spiritual in nature and that kind of thing. So that's uh, Nzame. And I'm not sure who Nzame might be. I don't think Nizami is related to anyone uh, in particular, at least in this comic. All right, so now we're on to Juba. 
Juba, I'm just so reluctant to talk about because I'm sure Juba's great, but Juba is also the the gorilla sidekick companion of a character named Buana Beast, who makes my skin crawl. If you want to see Buana Beast and understand why he makes my screen skin crawl, you can see him in uh, several Justice League Unlimited episodes, uh, including the one I think that oh, Emily, were you the one talking to me about? Oh no, maybe it was Darcy Ross talking about the one. There's an episode of uh, Justice League Unlimited where Wonder Woman turns into a pig. Have you seen that one? I feel like I feel like I have. Ha- I watched all of Justice League Unlimited, so I probably saw it, but I don't remember it. It's the one Wonder Woman turns into a pig. Batman gets Zatanna's help. It Cersei's the villainous, the villain of the episode, and Batman has to sing "I Feel Blue, Oh So Blue" at the end. Do you remember any of that? I don't. At all. I think it must be Darcy. <laughs> anyway, Buona, Buona Beast is in that episode because Batman needs somebody who, who's a tracker who can also talk to animals. It's ridiculous. Anyway, Juba, it's a well-loved episode because Kevin Conroy sings this blues song at the end. But anyway, Juba is Buona Beast's um, sidekick. So Juba is apparently here, uh, which I hope Greg's going to do it. He's going to put Buona Beast in this in Jung Justice, and I just can't. I don't know if I can handle it. Anyway, only two more guys. Uh, one of oh, them's easy. That, What's yeah, that? I just sorry. I went to Wikipedia and looked it up because I was like, I need to know who this character is. He hits on Zatanna in that episode, and it's weird. Yes, I remember that bit. For some reason, I blocked out the actual plot of that episode somehow. Yeah. It's been a few years. Yeah, he wears like a he wears like a, a loincloth and a mask, and that's it. Yeah, he's weird and creepy. Anyway, so. Then there's Mal- Malavar is just a character that's shown up as a kind of a sporting cast character. He's a scientist. He's actually one of the smartest apes in Gorilla City, which is saying something because they all have basically genius level intellect. And so I think Malavar and Juba are actually both adults in the comic. I don't think those are the kids because they, they're not mentioned until later on. I think Salavar tells is starting to yell out tactics or something saying Juba and Malavar, you know, disappear into the darkness and go do X, Y or Z. So I think that's uh, that's what's going on there. Uh, and then we get to, you know, the Holy One that they keep talking about in the comics, um, which was when we figure out, find out who it is at the end, I cheered, not because of some reasons, but I used to read this character, this Golden Gorilla character. I have some comics of him when I was a kid. His name is Congorilla, and he was a, he was a character that was in a comic called Congo Bill. Uh, which unfortunately was, you know, pretty classic for the age, you know, white man in Africa showing people how it's done, you know, back in the 1950s. So um, Congo Bill goes to the, he's a, he's a hunter and that kind of stuff. He's sworn to protect Africa. He goes to the deathbed of a friend of his who's a chief of a tribe who gives him this magic ring. I think Congo Bill had been hearing about this magical golden ape that had, that he never could quite track down ever. Um, the chief tells him that if he puts the ring on and, you know, rubs the ring, then his mind would be transported into the body of this golden ape. He doesn't believe him. Then Congo Bill gets trapped in a cave in. And so he's like got nothing else to lose. So he rubs the magic ring. And now he's out of the cave and inside the body of this basically superhero ape who goes and he frees his own body and he can just transfer back and forth. Right. So this superhero ape, though, like. I always remembered Kong Gorilla as just being this like golden gorilla, but apparently he's got magical powers that I just don't remember. Like he can change his size and become King Kong ish. And uh, he has superhuman uh, strength and uh, regenerative abilities. He's immortal. I'm like, Oh, but he's like a primate God. Right. I don't, I don't remember that part of it, but it's kind of referenced like that in this particular comic where they keep talking about him being like the chosen one and whatnot in the comic. Congo Bill's body dies, and when it dies, he's basically trapped in Congo Gorilla's body, and he's immortal. So now he's got all these, you know, superpowers, and he is a trained, like, oh god, hunter, and he's a pilot, and he speaks multiple languages and some other stuff. So that's who he is, and that's who that character is at the end, which never gets an explanation. So if you don't know any of this stuff, and they mention Congo Gorilla at the end, Emily's raising her hand and swinging it around. Then you you'll be like, uh, oh, okay, I guess there's a golden gorilla doing something. I don't know who this is. So that was definitely basically I was that Venn diagram. You got streetcar named Desire, and I got that one. Okay, <laughs> so that was like 
17, including the brain, 17 total mini secret origins, 16 of them primates, um, none of them monkeys, all of them apes. And whew. meanwhile, I just want to talk about awkward telepathic flirting and high school shenanigans. Right. <laughs> Hashtag on brand. For both of us. <laughs> okay. I don't even know what to say after that. Okay, there you go. Bam. All the gorillas. If you have questions about gorillas, I don't know. Don't ask me. No, come on. Come on. Come and ask us about them because I spent so much time just going over those gorillas. It had to be so fast. Many. Had to be fast. for rich. Oh, Run thanks so much. Again, um, huge uh, shout out to the uh, DCWikia.com uh, for a lot of their information. Comic Vine as well at comicvine.gamespot.com had some information I pulled from as well. Yeah, so much craziness uh, out there, but you can look up and read some of the insanity for yourself. All right, let's get into the artistic license. Have all four sidekicks ever been in the same place at the same time? Don't call us sidekicks. In artistic license, we will normally be recommending individual issues, miniseries, and graphic novel collections, both from DC and other companies who have titles we think Young Justice fans will enjoy. Artistic license is designed to give you an on-ramp into the classic story arcs of the past, so you might catch a glimpse of what's coming in the future. But this week... (laughs) But this week, I spent... Poor Emily was waiting for me to start recording this, because I spent like... An extra 30 minutes solid, 45 minutes maybe even, trying to figure out what best to recommend. I, when I was a kid, I really enjoyed the Kongorilla comics. They were, I thought they were a cool concept. As an adult, they make my skin crawl a little bit with the whole white man in Africa thing. You can go back and check any of that classic stuff out. There was also a four issue miniseries in like the 90s, I want to say 92, um, that you can check out. You can, Gorilla Grodd is all over the place. Um, and that kind of thing. So I'm going to recommend some some animated things that you can go see. I don't know of anything animated that Kongorilla has showed up in. But Ultra Humanite, you can see in Justice League Unlimited, um, in particular, a pretty hilarious episode with The Flash, where it's Christmas time, <laughs> Christmas time, and The Flash and Ultra Humanite are running around trying to get presents for kids, and it's hilarious. Gorilla Grodd, of course, you can see him in both the Justice League original series and in Justice League Unlimited and in the Flash live action series, they he showed up multiple times now as well. I think he's become a fairly large villain in the most recent season, but I haven't seen those. Uh, Solovar as well is also in those episodes of Justice League and Justice League Unlimited, um, including the very first episode with the men called Brave and the Bold, which has the Flash and Green Lantern in it, which is hilarious. You should go watch that two-parter of Justice League with those two in it. It's pretty great. And But hey, if you're one of the eight fans of DC comics and you have some references or some comics that you think are fantastic storylines, uh, or let me know what's going on with Congo gorilla these days. Um, now that Congo bill is dead, <laughs> get a hold of us on Twitter, on Facebook, on wherever you want to get a hold of us at. And with that, uh, let's please wrap up this mission and head out of the watchtower. <laughs> And the best way to support the show, of course, is to share it with a friend. You can also support us with a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. Leaving a rating or review pushes us up in the search ranks and helps other people find the show. You can also now find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. Uh, please continue to hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology and learn all about the many gorillas of DC Comics. <laughs> That's so and many girls. <laughs> there's so many. Uh and buy the show somewhere online until that DC streaming service launches hopefully soon. We've been getting more information, so hopefully soon. Yeah, until update soon. If we haven't dropped it already, actually. <laughs> we, we might. Promise. Uh, You can also now use hashtag Young Justice Outsiders when talking about season three online. And if you want to help us get more episodes, more secret origins, more actual play podcasts, and more of all the other stuff that we do, please consider supporting us through Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can help us do even more with the show while getting some great rewards for yourself. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, 
DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Thank you.